and the early hours of this icy London morning, I remind myself of a quote from the poet Shelley, a line from Peter Bell III, written in 1819. The quote, sometimes the devil is a gentleman. I recall the tales heard so often as a child, the many books written on the subject, perhaps the most notorious unknown killer in history, certainly one of the most thorough. He stalked women in the dark, only certain types of women. His calling card came in the shape of a mutilated corpse, his signature unmistakably cold. Surgical steel. I am once again reminded that a cunning psychopath armed with surgical knowledge and a razor-sharp scalpel can tear a human life apart in a very short time indeed. I seek the truth about just such a man. It began August 31, 1888. By the second week of November of that year, the hideous legend had become a global topic. Many questions were raised, the most enduring of which has haunted me all my life. Just who was Jack the Ripper? Was he a lone killer bent on revenge? Why did he strike only prostitutes? And why did the killings end with the fifth victim? On this walk through an isolated forest, I carry with me a book which has brought me halfway across the world. There have been many manuscripts theorizing on the Ripper case. But in the few days spent poring over this particular book, I became convinced that the author had at last presented the dark truth. The Ripper legend reached new heights when Hollywood became interested. And it was a Londoner who first brought Jack to the screen. Alfred Joseph Hitchcock, born 11 years after the Ripper had struck. In 1926, Hitch presented the motion picture all about Jack. It was called The Lodger. Pure fiction, but as thrillers go, a tantalizing glimpse at the Hitchcock genius that would follow. As for the book I carry with me, it is called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. The author is to this point known only to me by a few frantic telephone calls made at the most preposterous times in the early morning. His name is Stephen Knight. He lives not far from where the murders took place. His trek toward the truth began in September 1973, when, as a journalist for the East London Advertiser, he interviewed a man who would light the spark. The Advertiser was the lone surviving newspaper covering the area of Whitechapel, Jack's favorite prowling ground. The subject of Stephen Knight's interview in 1973 was a man named Joseph Sickett, son of the renowned Victorian painter Walter Sickett. An interview with the son of an artist is not what one would usually call earth-shattering material. But when the specter of Jack the Ripper becomes synonymous with the man's story, suddenly a whole new light blazes from the void of unanswered questions. My name is Ray McGregor, seeker in the unknown, if you like. My travels have taken me to the quiet stillness offered in this place to meet Stephen Knight and to unravel one of history's greatest and most macabre mysteries. This is a story which began in the English autumn of 1973 with that interview. Stephen Knight, the cover of the book is a little battered, but every well-read novel uh, is thus presented. I have poured over many a horror tale in my life and uh, gory mysteries, but the story of Jack the Ripper from those freezing days of the late 1880s has had many theories attached to it from criminologists to ordinary citizens and, of course, many other writers. But you presented a tale that I regard as the finest I have ever written. You embarked on a course that would take you through 18 months of mystery, intrigue, controversy, and a story that, once read, makes Watergate look like a, a Sunday school picnic, really, doesn't it? Mm, yes, it does, very much so. Um, I was researching for a year before I started to write and then writing for six months while researching the latter part of the book. Hmm. Let's go back to the East End of London in the late 1880s. These were certainly not good times for anybody. It was a very bleak, horrifying place, especially for prostitutes who were selling their souls for, what, a penny or something. How much were, were they likely to make if they were lucky? Penny or twopence a client, I suppose, in those days. Um, the price of a bed was fourpence, and for slightly less, you could get a, a rope in a very, very seedy doss house, running alive with cockroaches 
simply a rope strung along from from a wall to another wall, and a dozen or so people would hang on it, you know, like that, and sleep. My word. For the whole night. And that was luxury compared with what most of these poor women had. You know, they were sleeping out of doors on most nights and uh, under railway arches and anywhere they could mm. find some sort of shelter. Of course, let's now knock down one myth about our Jack. These women, A, were certainly not young, uh, and B, they were not in any shape or form pretty, the unfortunate victims. No, um, obviously, as you say, the, the average Hollywood representation is of a sort of music hall girl. These women were very much more degraded than that. Uh, they were in their 40s, most of them, and which meant in those days, with the sort of life they led, that they would have looked in their 60s at least. Mm. Uh, very haggard, very, very drunk, probably toothless, all of them, certainly. Some of them didn't have any teeth at all. Uh, they were really most unattractive-looking creatures. There were around 80,000 prostitutes working in London at that time. Mm. Yet, we are looking here, and we're going to look closely, at only five. Now, other writers have suggested, in fact, one writer suggested perhaps 20 victims. Other figures of six, seven, eight were attributed to the Ripper, but you say there were only five. Yes. Rip of victims. I'm not alone in saying that. Uh, Sir Melville McNaughton, who took over as assistant commissioner of, the Scotland, of Scotland Yard shortly after the Ripper murders ended, closed the, the Ripper file uh, with a report. And he stated in that file that the Whitechapel murderer had five victims and five victims only. Anyone has, who has delved at all deeply into the case since then has agreed with him on the medical evidence uh, alone, it is certain that uh, Jack the Ripper had no more than five victims. One writer suggested that he had only four because one of the victims uh, that this writer said uh, had her throat cut in the opposite direction from the other uh, victims. Uh, but I established from a previously undiscovered post-mortem report that this victim too, Elizabeth Stride, had her throat cut in exactly the same way. So, yes, it, it's definite that there were five victims and five victims only. This is Spitterfield in Whitechapel. At 3.45 a.m. on the morning of August 31, 1888, one police constable O'Neill had been informed by two railway workers on their way to the job that a woman's body lay in this area. For all intents and purposes, another drunken prostitute who'd fallen down in the night. For O'Neill, a horror beyond belief as he turned over the carved up remains of Whitechapel victim number one, Mary Ann Nichols. She was in her 40s. She was very down at heel, much the worse for drink most of the time because well, as with all the victims, that was the only solace they could find in life, gin, and the, um, the comfort that drunkenness brought. Uh, she wasn't too badly dressed because she'd not that much earlier been given uh, clothing by the Lambeth workhouse. She'd led a very poor life and a very distressing life. She'd had a very bad time with her husband and she'd had children and she'd come from the Lambeth area and, and come to the East End and settled into prostitution. On the night of August the 31st, she was with a friend called Emily Holland, who she last saw in, she, she was with her in Whitechapel at about one o'clock in the morning. She said goodbye to her. She was going off to find a client. Uh, and she said, look what a pretty bonnet I've got, or some such words as that. And she walked off towards Whitechapel Station. A few hours later, she was discovered in a doorway in Bucks Row, on the pavement, ritually laid out. Stephen, the words ritually laid out, 
they become more and more important as this story unfolds, correct? Right, yes. Let's look at the victims. We've just talked of Mary Nichols. Let's talk of her frightening injuries. It wasn't just a sweet killing. I mean, this woman was the first of five to be totally slaughtered. If we could look at a word, that would be it, wouldn't it? Yes, I mean, that's totally slaughtered in the sense that we're talking, in the, in the context of the Ripper killing, suggests she was a totally cut to pieces, which wasn't true. Uh, she was laid out and her intestines were sort of cut out and uh, there was a general mutilation in the genital area. Uh, her throat was cut from left to right. More detail than that we don't know because the newspapers didn't go into any more detail and the police and medical reports haven't survived. Uh, but it certainly was a very horrifying murder not nearly as horrifying as those which were to follow. It was on another, in another level of society that disquiet was felt at this first murder. The source of the information that the Queen of England, Victoria, was concerned by this murder was a telegram. It was a telegram which she sent in November, uh, three months later, after Jack the Ripper's final murder. She sent a telegram to the Prime Minister saying, you promised me after the first murder took place that you would consult your colleagues about it. Now that, though it has been known for many years that she, the Queen sent that telegram, it has, the significance of it just hasn't been seen. Because while murder was a commonplace thing in the East End, on Mary Nichols' murder, the Queen of England made the Prime Minister promise to consult his colleagues about that murder, which meant that she knew more about it than the average East End citizen. She knew that when only one murder had been committed, she knew at that stage that more were to come. At ten past six in the morning of September 8, 1888, Inspector Joseph Chandler on duty at the Commercial Street Police Station was informed there had been another Whitechapel murder. This time, once again, a prostitute in her mid-forties, Anne Siffy, otherwise known as Annie Chapman. She again was laid out. At her feet were laid out several trinkets. There were two rings, two brass rings, laid side by side, and two mint condition brass farthings laid edge to edge. And she was even more mutilated, far more appalling injuries than Mary Nichols. She, her entrails were completely taken out, cut out of her, and her intestines were thrown over her shoulder. Her throat was cut so deeply that her head was almost severed from her body. September 29, 1888, time for our Whitechapel friend to strike again. But tonight, he would go berserk. Two victims in the one evening. His first, the gangling Swedish prostitute, once again 45 years old. She was known as Long Liz, Elizabeth Stride. Long Liz Stride was found murdered in a backyard or courtyard adjoining the uh, a, a socialist club in Stepney, south of Commercial Road. Catherine Eddowes was discovered, as I say, 45 minutes later in Mitre Square, Aldgate. The first victim, Stride, the only injuries she had was a cut throat, which, as I said, has led some people to say she wasn't a ripper victim at all. Uh, her throat was cut from left to right. The second victim, Catherine Eddowes, was horribly cut about. Her 
not only was her body cut about in the manner of Nichols and Chapman and her entrails thrown over the shoulder again, but she was stabbed about the face, cut very deliberately on the cheeks, and her eyelids were slit. And she also had her throat cut from left to right. This is Mitre Square in London. The noise you hear in the background, new construction as buildings rise. It's doubtful to consider that anyone in this area would remember or have even heard of the story that makes this place, or what's left of it, such a grisly tale. Behind us, school children play in their lunch hour. Yet it's at this very spot, early in the morning, 1.45 to be precise, September 30, 1888, when the grisly remains of one Catherine Eddowes were discovered, not far from where I stand. She wasn't a very pretty woman. She was about 45 years old, her brown hair turning gray. She was a prostitute, but she had made one mistake in life. That mistake is that she had frequently used an alias. And that alias was Marie Kelly. You see, Jack the Ripper really felt he had found his ultimate quarry because Marie Kelly was the one that connected everything in this amazing story. For this woman aging on an early autumn morning, it appeared that everything looked pretty rosy. Maybe a nice encounter with a gentleman, perhaps. She'd needed money more than anything else. What she'd found can only be described as that which is existing in the corridors of nightmares. Stephen Knight, I want to talk about the final victim, Marie Kelly. Yes, she was butchered like an animal. At the same time, there, there was this element of ritual. She was laid out on her own bed. She is the only victim to have been discovered indoors. Uh, and she was laid out in a sort of ritualistic fashion with uh, one arm folded across her chest. Um, what there was left of her chest, both her breasts had been cut off uh, her heart had been torn out, her entrails had been pulled out and intestines were thrown all over the walls and hung on the picture rails. Uh, as I say, her breasts had been cut off and they were on a side bench by her bed with her, along with her liver. Uh, there was blood everywhere. This lady, a lot of things hinge on Marie Kelly, don't they? Everything really hinges on Marie Kelly or her conduct. Uh, an old nun who was interviewed in 1973, uh, she then lived at Providence Row Women's Refuge, which was only two or three minutes from where Mary Kelly had lived and died, remembered an elderly nun in 1915 saying, and, she, and this elderly nun had been around at the time the, the killings had taken place, saying to her, if it had not been for Mary Kelly, or Marie Kelly, none of the women would have been murdered. In other words, there would have been no Jack the Ripper. Uh, and as I say, so Mary Kelly's story and what led up to the events of autumn 1888 are crucial to the whole affair. Jack the Ripper is a misnomer. And that is true because Jack the Ripper was not one man, but three. All working together for a specific purpose. Let's go one step past that and look at these five prostitutes and say that in an area the size of London out of 80,000, they were all from roughly one pretty small area and in fact they could have had more connections than being common victims. Absolutely. Once again, this is a, a point which has never been brought out before. Nobody has researched the case deeply enough to have discovered this central point. Out of all the prostitutes in London, 80,000, Jack the Ripper killed five. And 
all these people representing the killings as random maniac killings just do not consider that these women all knew each other. Two of them lived in the same house. They all, three, three of them lived in the same street and all of them rubbed shoulders daily in the same pub. Amazing. Which is 20 yards from where Mary Kelly was killed. Now, if we get back to what that nun said, if it had not been for Marie Kelly, none of these murders would have happened. Let us now look at why this lady becomes so important. Was she a witness to something? Did she know too much? To answer that, I have to take you from the East End back several years to the West End of London. Right. And back to Walter Sickert. The painter. The painter. Mm. The father of Joseph Sickert, my informant, and the original source of the story which I was investigating and which at every step I took became truer. Sunrise breaks over the horizon and shines its light across the east end of London. The Ripper, along with his two accomplices, left in his wake the horrid remains of the last victim, Marie Jeanette Kelly. No doubt by this time the killers would be settled down to a good, hearty breakfast. Even an animal eats after the kill. We now find ourselves in 1884 in Cleveland Street in West London. Sickert's studio was in Cleveland Street and just opposite the studio was a sweet shop, confectionery shop, in which there worked a girl called Annie Elizabeth Crook. Mm. She was a poor country girl and a Catholic. Sickert's antecedents were quite impressive. His father and his grandfather had been painters to the Royal Court of Denmark and he knew both Princess Alexandra, who was Danish, and her husband, Edward the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII, well. He wa was approached by Alexandra in the early 80s to take her son, Prince Eddie, under his wing because Eddie was becoming stifled at court. He was mixing only in the very narrow circles of, of the court. He, he was having no outside experience at all and, and she was very worried about his personal development and she wanted him to see the world of art, to, to just see a wider life uh, and more of his future subjects because had Eddie lived he would have become king in 1910. Mm. And Sickert readily agreed he was always ready to ingratiate himself with the powerful for obvious reasons. He, he didn't have all that much money and he wanted to get on himself. Uh, so Prince Eddie, uh, who was Queen Victoria's grandson of course, began to pay secret visits to Sickert in the guise of his younger brother Albert, Albert Sickert. And so here we have them in those early years of that uh, decade getting on together very well. Sickert goes out with uh, Prince Eddie to the pub. Uh, and, and Eddie sees all sorts of things that he would otherwise not have done. All right, Stephen. Prince Albert Victor Christian Edward, future King of England, and the great artist Walter Sickert. The prince now with his newfound alias, able to enjoy the part-time life of a commoner. So what were they getting up to? Was it out? dropping a few pints of ale, or were they a wenching, or what were the typical activities that Sickert and, uh, and Eddie were getting into? Well, both of those things, um, and Eddie took a few brief painting lessons from Sickert and met all Sickert's friends who were a motley bunch and was generally enjoying himself. Sickert knew this, a girl who worked in the shop 
opposite Annie Elizabeth Crook, as I said. Mm. And he was sick, it was very fond of this girl. And he introduced the, the pair, Eddie and Annie. Eddie was struck by a certain similarity, this girl, to his mother. And he got on very well with her. And eventually, he fell in love with her and she with him. And they were secretly married. He couldn't officially marry her. Uh -huh. She was a Catholic for a start. Oh, yes. Um, he was under 25, so he would have had to get permission to marry her. He married her under a false name, but he married her, nevertheless, at a St. Saviour's private chapel near Cleveland Street. Then, in 1885, Annie bore Eddie a child, a daughter, who was born at Marylebone Workhouse and who was christened Alice Margaret Crook. She underwent two baptisms, an Anglican bap uh, baptism for Eddie and a Catholic baptism for Annie. But inevitably, it reached the ears of the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury. The throne was very unpopular at that time. There was constant fear of revolution and Salisbury himself was especially frightened of anarchists, socialists. There was a rising tide of socialism, and the government was very unpopular, the throne was very unpopular. He believed that it would take very little anyway to end the monarchy with Victoria's death. With Prince Eddie's behavior, he believed that if that became public, it would be almost a certainty that the monarchy would end, and, and end immediately, that there would be revolution, total revolution in England. Uh, so that information about Eddie marrying a Catholic, because anti-Catholic feeling then was incredibly intense. Mm. If he had to keep that silence at all costs. So he staged a police raid in Cleveland Street while Eddie and Annie were together. Eddie was taken back to court and severely reprimanded, and Annie was taken away and confined in a hospital. And she spent the rest of her life in hospitals, workhouses, and prisons after some sort of primitive brain operation had been performed on her. Or well, some perverted to lobotomy. A, with... Something like that, to erase all memory of her past yeah. and her alliance with, with the prince. During that raid, the child escaped with her nanny. And that nanny, who had been taken on by Sickert, was Mary Kelly. Mary Kelly escaped from Cleveland Street, taking the child with her, and she escaped to the East End. Eventually, the, the child found its way back, her way back, by a, a circuitous route to Sickert, and Sickert arranged for her upbringing in France with some friends there. Mary Kelly fell in with a group of prostitutes and eventually, completely down and out, they resorted to blackmail. She shared her dangerous knowledge with them and they blackmailed someone closely associated with the, the case. The fear was that these women who were walking around the East End knew of Eddie's conduct. Mm and were therefore in, in possession of information that could topple the throne. So like Annie Crook, they had to be silenced. And the Prime Minister put the operation into the hands of a man he trusted very greatly because that man had been very closely associated with silencing Annie Crook. Salisbury, I'm sure, never wanted anybody murdered. He put the case into the hands of this man, as I say, whom he trusted. Mm. This man decided the women must die. To have them certified as lunatics, he thought would be dangerous in the extreme. One lunatic was bad enough, but if you had four, five, six lunatics, all crying out the same story, somebody was going to see a pattern somewhere. Right. And, and you know, there were plenty of very high-ranking, articulate politicians around who were, would have been eager to see that pattern and use it against the throne and the, the government in power. Victoria knew nothing about this. Right. I mean, she, she wouldn't have condoned murder or, or silencing in any way at all at this, you know, 
this one man whom we'll look at more closely a little later. He was in charge of it. He uh, had two helpers, said Sickert. These three men, and these unfortunate prostitutes, and a ritual in just about all of them. The entrails being torn out and thrown over the shoulder, uh, portions of flesh being taken off the face. Uh, does it go beyond, shall we say, the trademark of one ripper? Or is this a way of slaughtering that goes more deeply into something more sinister? Sickert told his son, and his son told me, that the women were murdered according to Freemasonic ritual. That much of their ritual is based on murder. They are a secret society. On the whole, they are a society which does good, much good to charity, but they are a secret society of men who meet and perform rituals. Some of their basic rituals are the mime of mythical murders, some taken from the Bible, some taken from Egyptian myth. And these murders are the cutting, or, or let's take one example, the sign of the entered apprentice, the lowest rank of Freemasonry, is the cutting of the throat from left to right. All the ripper victims had their throats cut from left to right. At another degree, the mime for initiation is for the victims, heart and vitals to be taken out and thrown over the left shoulder. Stephen, why, why this particular mime? I mean, where does this begin, this, this whole story of, why do they go through the mime of this? Well, well simply to preserve the secrecy of their, their order. Um, a, a mason swears on pain of terribly violent death. This kind of death? Yeah, all these various kinds of death, mm -hmm. and, and, and it varies from level to level, yeah. um, that he will retain the secrets of his order and never betray another mason. Hmm. Um, when you've reached a certain level in masonry, you swear never to betray another mason, whatever he is engaged in, whether it be right or wrong. That covers murder, the lot. So, uh, here we have these murders which closely parallel the, the, the mimed Masonic murders. Mm. And there's no doubt about that. Um, the, all the research I did into masonry shows that these are Masonic ritual killings. Numbers 108 to 119, Goulston Street. The entrance to Wentworth Dwellings. Here we are. That morning, September 18, 1888, Police Constable Long passed by at 2.20 a.m. on his normal beat. He noticed nothing unusual inside here, not a thing. 35 minutes later, he certainly did. He noticed some writing on the wall, those famous words, that did not connect anything until one other clue was found beneath the writing here on the floor. A bloody piece of apron, later positively identified as that belonging to the late Catherine Eddowes. No one has really known what the message said until I discovered in the Home Office file a faithful copy of the message and a copy of the style of handwriting. And that message said, the Jews, spelled J-U-W-E-S, are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Now that is a very weird word, Jews, what does it mean? Immediately it was discovered, Sir Charles Warren the Chief Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police rushed from the West End, from Scotland Yard, to the East End and rubbed the message from the wall. The only clue ever left by the Ripper and he rubbed it out. He was covering something up. What? He said later that he thought that there might be anti-Jewish riots. He said people might believe that J-U-W-E-S referred to the Jews. It was ludicrous to say that, because that message was in a doorway which could easily have been cordoned off. Mm. It didn't say Jews anyway. 
You mean Warren knew himself? Warren what this knew meant. what the message meant. Warren was one of the highest ranking Freemasons in the world. And if you delve into Masonic literature, you discover the word Jews. And what it refers to is three apprentice Masons called Jubela, Jubelo, and Jubelum. The Jews. Who murdered the Grand Master in charge of building Solomon's Temple. And on, most, on that event, most of Freemasonry's sacred ritual is based. In other words, that message means the Freemasons are the men that will not, not be, be blamed, blamed for, for nothing. nothing. The most powerful Mason of them all, the Earl of Carnarvon. He was the Grand Master over all Masons of the world and knew everything about the river and the cover-up that in today's standards makes Watergate look like a fairy tale. It's worth pointing out that the American dollar bill has the all-seeing Masonic eye. At the time of its print, a high-ranking Freemason was having his picture emblazoned on the other side. That man, the President of the United States, George Washington, another famous Mason, the King of Prussia, Frederick the Great. Now he was a true leader of men. Stephen, back to the murders most foul, these, these poor women. Now, they were slaughtered in such a way that one would imagine a torrent of blood would have gushed forth on the pavement, yet such very little blood was actually found, in ex well, except for Marie Kelly's case, uh, around the area of the crime. Yes, this is one of the enduring mysteries of the Ripper case. M no writer has been able to explain it. There was so little blood found at one of the murders, for instance, uh, Annie Chapman's, that uh, the doctor who attended suggested it would have filled one or two wine glasses at most. And yet she had had her head severed from her body almost. Uh, there was speculation at the time that the women couldn't have been murdered where they were found, but that they had been murdered elsewhere and then later deposited at these spots. Sickert told his son that the three of the women, at least, were in fact murdered in a moving carriage. The way in which these murders occurred, surely these women... I mean, it is such a nightmarish tale. They must have screamed, struggled, given some clues uh, as though being mutilated, the uh, people nearby must have heard something going on. Not necessarily. According to Sickert, the women were fed black grapes poisoned with laudanum. That's a tincture of opium. Oh. And that induced unconsciousness and death before any mutilations were carried out. So there would be no struggle, no screams. Right. Uh, and would have, it would have enabled all the surgery, the barbaric surgery that took place on them to be carried out with relative ease and speed. After which the cab went on its way back to its owner's residence. It was obviously covered in gore and blood. It was washed out ready for its next grisly assignment. Yeah, but it would have been covered in less blood than had, obviously, had the victims been... Struggling in. Yeah. Stephen, very few mass murderers ever give up without giving a clue or two. And there were many letters supposedly written by the Ripper to Scotland Yard, but you say there's only one genuine Ripper letter. Yes, I do. Uh, there were hundreds, there are hundreds of letters purportedly sent by the Ripper, still in the Scotland Yard file. And I've seen them and I've read them all. And many books are based their cases on any selection of these letters which the writer chooses to make, which, that's any selection which fits his case. One book in particular is based entirely on these letters. And to believe that these letters are all genuine would be to believe that the Ripper spent all his time writing and that he had a vast knowledge of languages and went from to places as far away as Barcelona and Venezuela mm. to post his mad messages. It's all ludicrous. Uh, they were from hoaxes. 
all the letters but one. And that letter came accompanied by half a human kidney. Which, half a kidney? Half a kidney, which has been established as near as it's possible to establish anything that it was Catherine Eddowes' kidney. The letter and the kidney were sent to Mr. George Lusk. He was chairman of the Whitechapel Vigil Vigilance Committee, set up to patrol the streets at night to protect citizens. I'll read you the letter. From hell. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. T'other piece I fried and ate, it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Jack the Ripper was not one man, but three. Are we looking at three actual rippers, three people who had knives and scalpels in their hands and did the cutting, or are we talking about one specialist and two accomplices? We're talking about two killers and one accomplice. Interesting. To what extent the one accomplice participated, I've not been able to discover. It's not possible ever to discover that. So let us talk about the one accomplice. I want to know who this is. I want to know about this man. Well, there were three men. There were no women involved in this. Oh, no. There were three men. Uh, before I name any names, why don't I take you to where the chief ripper is today? This is a bleak place, Stephen, here. Yes, like, like a Bronte novel, isn't it? Oh, my word. Cold enough. But this is the graveyard of Thorpless Soken in Essex. And here lies Jack the Ripper. This grave? That's it. William Withy Gull. That's him. The man in charge of the Ripper operation. And the man who committed for the five murders. So the man out of everyone's bad dreams, the, the one you imagine had the cloak, the guy who held the scalpels and did all the frenzied cutting, this is the man. That's it? Yes. He was put in charge of it by Lord Salisbury. He'd already committed Annie Elizabeth Crook to an asylum. So he was, uh, as I say, he was already involved and they wanted somebody to silence the other women who successfully. He was a high-ranking Freemason, and then something strange happened. He was an incredibly bizarre man. He was of a, a very strange turn of mind. He decided that it would be just so dangerous to, to commit the other women that they had to be killed, and so that, that's how he went about it. He, he had them hunted down by his tour accomplice, by his two accomplices, his two helpers, uh, and he killed them in a Masonic way. So a man of supremely high medical standing, the man who did the cutting, the Chief Ripper, lies there. Yes. Physician in ordinary to Queen Victoria. Jack the Ripper. Sickert said that the man who drove the handsome cab was John Netley. He was the man who had previously ferried Prince Eddie to and from Sickert's, between Sickert's studio and the palace. So he was already involved. Yes. Uh, whether or not he was a mason is in doubt. Sickert didn't know. But he certainly wanted to get in with powerful people and would do anything to be able to, you know, give himself a step up on the ladder. Right. Um, so he, he was uh, recruited to, to drive the the death carriage of William Gull, and he also laid the um, bodies out in, in the Masonic way. He also helped track down the women. Uh, he tracked down Mary Kelly, said Sickert, with the aid of a painting of her. Um, and the third man, according to Sickert, was none other than Sir Robert Anderson, who was the deputy commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. But uh, that turned into something different when I started investigating it. It was, uh, that was a very weird 
There's a twist coming that's up, a, isn't that's it? That's right, yes, there is. 74 Brook Street, London, W1. Residence of Sir William Gull. The palatial abode of a specialist in brain diseases and part-time abortionist in royal circles. The early morning trek up the staircase, quietly, to wife Susan Ann, his two children, Cameron and Caroline. A day of earnest work, a return to his loving family, and a nightly exit to the most unholy slaughterhouse of them all. In monetary terms, Sir William Withy Gull was the most wealthy man indeed, but in the treasury of the soul, he appeared as a bleak, bankrupt specter, schizophrenic in nature, psychopathic in attitude. He dispensed certificates of insanity as casually as one would kill an insect. He did just that so easily to any crook. Dispense by day, dissect by night, out through the courtyard, down the stairs, into the tunnel. And thus, another chilling conspiracy with the night rider, coachman John Netley. The quarters which sheltered the carriage of death can be found in a most convenient spot at the rear of 74 Brook Street. For Gull and Netley, a most tidy arrangement. Walter Sickett told his son that the third man was none other than Sir Robert Anderson, Assistant Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. I looked into that allegation as I'd looked into everything that Sickett had said up to that point. Mm. And everything up to that point, of course, had proved absolutely true with solid ev evidence to back it up. But to my surprise at that stage, at that late stage in the inquiry, I found that there was no evidence at all to support the allegation that Sir Robert Anderson was directly involved in the murders themselves. Mm. He was certainly involved in the cover-up, but certainly in no way could I see that he was the third man. And then I, I realized that the evidence had been staring me in the face all along. The third man was Walter Sickert. He was forced into it virtually by Gull and Salisbury and all the rest of the Masons. Yes because he had been involved from the beginning. He knew Mary Kelly, he knew Annie Crook, and he could lead them to Mary Kelly. Who else had painted that picture which Netley had used to question people in the East End? And there is, in fact, extant a picture called Blackmail, which very closely uh, resembles a, a picture of Mary Kelly in the, in the newspapers of the day. Uh, Walter Sickert, in old age, came to think he was Jack the Ripper after a stroke. He used to roam the East End of London, dressed in clothes like the Ripper. My word, really? Yes, absolutely. He told his son that he painted the truth about the Ripper killings into his paintings. What, clue, painting by painting? That in certain of his paintings, there, ex there were clues as to, to the truth of the Ripper killing. Yes. Um, he painted, for instance, a series of murders called the Cam... a series of pictures called the Camden Town Murders, which he said were based on the Mary Kelly murder. There is a picture of himself, the artist in his studio, and in front of him in that picture is this, this bust. But it isn't really a bust. You can see it's a human torso and, and, and a piece of the intestine snakes from the abdomen over the shoulder. The shoulder, hey. One of the pictures, La Hollandaise, um, is it's a woman on a bed and it very closely resembles the picture of Mary Kelly after she'd been mutilated. It, it, the face looks like an animal's face. The man who did the cutting, the Chief Ripper, lies there. Yes. Physician in ordinary to Queen Victoria. Jack the Ripper. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. T'other piece I fried and ate, it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Mr. Lusk, Mr. Lusk, Mr. Lusk. Thank you. 